Welcome to this introduction to Nat5 Trig. In this video we'll cover what Trig actually is and why we care about it. We'll begin by briefly reviewing some National 4 Trig concepts and we'll introduce some other concepts that are relevant to National 5 and then we'll go on to justify why we actually care about learning Trig at all. But first, a quick note on who I am and what this series is about. My name is Ben and I'm a fourth year theoretical physics student at the University of Edinburgh and I work in collaboration with the School of Maths as part of an outreach course in the School of Physics, which is the school I'm part of, to develop a video series on that five trigonometric skills. This is a screenshot from the SQS course specification, which highlights all the skills that are involved in the trigonometric skills unit. Essentially, this video series will be a set of informal videos where I'll go through each of the trig topics on the left here, which will cover everything trig in that five. So if I stutter or have any ums or as as I go through, I apologise, but I would rather it sound conversational than be a kind of formal scripted lecture. For each of the bigger and harder topics, which are essentially just the top two videos here, I'll do one or two concept videos on the topic, which will just highlight what the topic's about and why we care about it. And I'll also do an accompanying examples video, which will just run through examples and exam paper questions. And for the easier ones, and the ones that are generally performed better on, which is bottom three, I'll just do one combined video, which will just go through the, both the concept and examples, and it, it'll be a little bit faster. And I'm hoping that all the videos will be under 10 minutes, or around about there, because who wants to watch a 20 minute plus video on trig? When we are first introduced to trig, it's in the context of your angle triangles. So let's take a right angle triangle, and pick an angle, let's see this one, and remind ourselves what the three sides are. So the longest side, the one opposite the right angle, is the hypotenuse, the one opposite the angle is the opposite, and the one next to it is adjacent, where adjacent just means next to. So these are all frequently shortened to three letters, just so it's faster to write. And the trigonometric functions are defined as follows. The sine function, just sine x, is opposite over the hypotenuse. The cosine function, or cos x, is adjacent over the hypotenuse. And the tangent function, tan x, is opposite over the adjacent. And to remember these, we write down the phrase Sokatoa. And some of you might remember an annoying song. I can't quite remember how it goes, but I do remember it being stuck in my head at the time. And the reason we write the middle letter above is just so that we remember how the multiplication division works. So let's remind ourselves of the details of how it actually works by pulling up two examples here. And we'll get them bigger so we can see what we're doing. Okay, let's quickly write down Sokatoa, just so we can tick off what we have so we, can, we know which equation to use. So we can see on the left here that the ang this is the angle we want, and so we've got the opposite. So we'll tick off the O's. And we've got the hypotenuse, which is the biggest side, so we'll tick off the H's as well. And as you can see, sine's the only one that we've got both the other things ticked other than the angle. So it's sine we've got to use. And we're looking for the angle, so we're looking for sine X. And because O is raised we know that it goes above and I'll write out the full thing just to remind ourselves what they mean so it's opposite over the hypotenuse okay so the opposite here is 4 and the hypotenuse is 8 and 4 over 8 is just a half so that means sine x equals a half therefore x is oh, that's disappeared, is the inverse sine of a half if you pop that in your calculator that just comes out to be 30 degrees okay moving on to the next one this time we're looking for a side, so we'll start out by writing out our socket toe again. And you'll notice this time that the side we've been given is the adjacent, this guy here, the 10. So we'll tick off the A's, and we're looking for the hypotenuse. So we'll tick off the H's, and we can see immediately that it's cosine that we're looking for. So we're looking for the hypotenuse, so let's write out the hypotenuse, and we can see that the A's above in the socket toe, so adjacent goes on top. And C is just co cause the angle below. And the adjacent here is 10. And the angle is 25. Put the brackets on that to make it obvious. And if you pop that in your calculator, it comes out to be 11. So now we're back with our right angle triangle. Let's see if we can get the trig graphs just from our right angle triangle definition. So let's recall that sine x is just the opposite of the hypotenuse. And let's keep the long side, the hypotenuse, fixed. We'll fix it to 1. And we'll see what happens to sine x, which is now just equal to the opposite over 1, which is just the opposite, as we change the angle. So let's move the triangle to the side, and we'll plot what happens to sine x, which is now just equal 
to this side here as we change this angle. So we'll plot what happens as we move the angle from 0 right way through the range from 0 to 360. And we'll write down this in increments of 90. And we'll see why we do 0 to 360 shortly. Okay, so I've sped up this clip of me plotting sine x by running through all the angles because it's a long and tedious process. But it is good to see how we can get the graphs just from the triangles before I show you a better way shortly after. The graph starts at 0 because the opposite side disappears when the angle goes down to 0. And then we go through all the angles in increments of 30, marking that the opposite is equal to a half at 30 degrees, and then about 0 0.87 at 60 degrees. You'll see 0 0.86, but I should have rounded up, until we get to 90 degrees. At 90, the opposite is the same as length as the hypotenuse, which is 1, and the triangle basically disappears. We then keep counting past 90, 90 degrees, even though all the angles inside the triangle are less than 90, because we measure the angle from where we started, all the way around, counterclockwise to where the hypotenuse is. The graph then goes negative when we rotate the triangle past 180 degrees because the triangle is now upside down and the opposite side is now measured down the way. We then go all the way through the minimum at 270 when the opposite is equal to negative 1 and back towards 360, back to where we started and then we plot the familiar sine curve. And we can do the exact same with cos except this time we look at the adjacent because if you remember cos is actually the adjacent of the hypotenuse and if we set the hypotenuse equal to 1 then it's just equal to the adjacent. So instead we look at um, oops, the bottom part of the triangle and we do the exact same thing that was quite a tedious and a not very intuitive process there's a much better way to see where the graphs come from that for some reason we didn't learn high school at all and I didn't come across it until I got into university when we derive the graphs of the triangle the opposite side from the angle, so this is the angle here the opposite side from the, the angle, this one here was sine x the adjacent one was cos x, and this is looking at what happens to these two sides as we take the angle right way around from 0 to 360, is how we've got the graphs. This is much easier to see, and I don't know why it's not interesting in high school, I think it's a much more intuitive way to think about it. This is much easier to see when we look at what's called the unit circle. So again, we can see that the opposite side, which is this one here, um, I'll probably do the arrow that way, more sense. This side here is opposite and it's sine theta. Theta is just a different variable we use sometimes for angles than x. And this guy here, the adjacent, is cos. And we can see what happens as we go down the unit circle. So this is a little animation here that hi highlights how we get the graphs from the unit circle. And you can see here that starting at 0 degrees, as we go around the full 360 degrees of the circle, and that's why we go from 0 to 360 in the graphs, the, the side, we get the sine shape, which as you can see, just goes like this here. We get it just from looking at the height as we go in the circle. And the cos graph, which goes along here, and it, it turns around just so it's not going this way because that'd be hard to follow. It's just the horizontal part of the circle as it goes around. So sine and cos are really just the height and the, the, the horizontal width, if you like, as you take a point around the circle. We'll revise the unit circle and explore trig graphs more in the next video on trig graphs. But for now, we'll look at why we care about trig at all. Right angle triangles were used extensively in the past for estimating distances, map making and navigation. A quick Wikipedia search revealed that in the 6th century BC, a Greek philosopher is recorded as using similar triangles to estimate the height of the pyramids. And in the 3rd century, a prominent Chinese cartographer identified measuring right angles and acute angles as the fifth of his six principles for accurate map making necessary to establish distances. Indian mathematicians use trig to estimate the distance from the Earth compared to the distance from the Earth to the Sun compared to the distance from the Earth to the Moon. They wait until the Moon was half full so that the Moon, the Sun, and the Earth formed the right angle triangle, and then measured this angle here to be a seventh of a degree. So the triangle is much narrower than it's actually shown here. So that means that the opposite, which is the distance from the Earth to the Moon, can be compared to the hypotenuse, which is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So that, that means sine of the angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is the distance from the Earth to the Moon, over the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And in pops in the calculator, it comes out as 1 over 400, which means that the ratio of the distance from the Earth to the Moon compared to the distance from the Earth to the Sun 
is 1 in 400. So the, four, so the sun is 400 times further away than the moon is. And this was measured back in the 3rd century just using trig. Sundials also work using trig. And in terms of modern applications, we still use them to calculate distances or ratios in architecture and engineering. Let's see how we can use basic trig to measure the height of a building. So let's say you're about 10 metres away from the building, but you don't want to physically measure the whole building. What you can do instead is just roughly estimate the angle that it takes to look up at the top of the building. And now that we've formed a right angle triangle, we can use trig to figure out the height. So let's say this side here is, we'll call it X, and it's clearly the opposite. And we've also got the adjacent. So let's write out the socket to figure out which one we need to use. And since we've got the opposite and the adjacent, we can see here the tan is one we're supposed to use. So because the O is raised, it means it goes on top. So that means that the opposite is just equal to tan of the angle times the adjacent. And our opposite is X, we'll just call it X. X equals tan 74 times our adjacent, which is 10. And you pop that on your calculator, it comes out to be 35. And we'll put it in meters, it's just in meters. And if we're roughly, our head's roughly one meter off the ground, we'll add that on. So the total height is 36 meters. Sine and cosine graphs are waves. And we can model a staggering amount of everyday wave-like phenomena, like water waves, light, sound, and electrical currents, as sine waves. This GIF here shows the splitting of light into its constituent colours, which are all just sine waves of different frequencies. And we can combine or superimpose di waves to, of different frequencies to create any shape we want using results from a branch of science called Fourier analysis. This here shows sine waves being combined, where n is the number of waves that's being combined, to make any arbitrary shape we want. And we can also do this in 2D or 3D to make more shapes like this, this phoenix here. All of music theory and sound engineering is based on sound waves. Studying waves appears across most aspects of engineering, for example, currents inside electrical engineering. engineering. A quick Wikipedia search reveals that trig spans across nearly every scientific field. Here's an oscilloscope that shows the wave-like nature of current and it also allows you to make measurements. And here is a full electromagnetic spectrum of light, which are all just sine waves with vastly different frequencies. Links for all of this info and images, as well as other additional resources, can be found in the description. This is the pilot video, a kind of test or taster, so please let me know how you found in this video and let me know your thoughts in the comments and in the feedback poll I'll put in the description. I will make improvements based off the feedback and my experiences in making this video. For example, I now know the audio wasn't great in places, but I do know how to improve it, as well as making some other changes to make this series as interesting and accessible as possible. And now we'll be moving on to the actual topics in the Trig Skills Unit, starting with Trig Graphs.